Hallo, schön, dass du wieder mit dabei bist. Heute gibt es etwas Besonderes, nämlich mein Terry Terry Interview. Ich durfte diese Autorin nämlich auf der Frankfurter Buchmesse treffen. Ich bin nur ein kleines bisschen innerlich gestorben, aber glücklicherweise ist Phil von Phil So Sophie mitgekommen und hat auch noch gefilmt. Und es hat mich irgendwie so ein bisschen beruhigt, weil wenn jemand dabei ist, den du wenigstens so ein bisschen kennst, dann ist es irgendwie noch mal weniger schlimm. Was bei diesem Interview rausgekommen ist, ähm, erfährst du jetzt. Ich habe so gut wie nichts weggeschnitten, außer meine äh, 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 Stotterphasen, damit du wirklich einen kompletten Eindruck von diesem Interview bekommst. Wir saßen fast 45 Minuten zusammen, haben aber ungefähr nur 20 Minuten davon ja, mit diesem Interview geplaudert. Und das wurde selbstverständlich auch für dich festgehalten. Ich laber schon wieder um den heißen Brei rum. Ich würde sagen, es geht einfach mal los. Und zwar starten wir mit dem Speed-Interview-Teil, den ich vorbereitet habe. Und ich wünsche dir viel Spaß damit. Your favorite author is? I don't know that I've got a favorite. I'm not going to be fast. I can't do it. I can't be fast. You can do it. Um, Tolkien, maybe? Okay. That's a good choice. Okay. okay. Your favorite character of all the books you wrote is? I love them all. Ich habe ihr dann Fragen zu ihr als Person gestellt und äh, diese hörst du jetzt. I saw that you lived in a lot of different countries. Yes. And which one did you like the most? I like different places for different reasons, but I think where I live now is the place that feels the most like home to me because I've lived in one place the longest and I've, I've been in the same village. We have moved house recently, but I've been in the same village for I think 14 years now. 13 years, something like that. And I've never lived in one place that long before. So. And I also read that you worked in different jobs. Yes. In a lot of different jobs. And which one did you like the most? And which one did, did you dislike the most? Um, well, being an author, obviously, is the best. You know, I mentioned the pajamas earlier, and making up stories for a living is, you know, the most amazing thing that you can possibly do. Yeah. I also worked in a library for a while, which I enjoyed, but it, um, it wasn't, it didn't really have a career path. There's a lot of problems with libraries in, in the UK right now with closures and things, so it wasn't going anywhere, I suppose. Um, as far as what I liked the least, um, I'm not sure if I'd put it quite that way, but I was a lawyer for a while in Canada and I, it didn't suit my personality, I think. Um, I'm not someone that could ever go into negotiations and hide my hand, you know what I mean? I'm just, it's just not the way my, the way I am. I just probably come right out and say what the bottom line was and you're not supposed to do it that way. <laughs> you know, so it just didn't suit my personality, I think. Yeah. Selbstverständlich habe ich sie auch etwas zu ihrem äh, neuesten Buch gefragt, nämlich zu infiziert und was sie dazu gesagt hat, hörst du jetzt. How did you get the idea of creating an infection that kills nearly everybody? I saw that you studied microbiology. Yes. Did yes. you get the idea why you work at the university? Or? Um, My first degree was in microbiology, which is going back quite a long way, and I think I'd always wanted to write something about an epidemic. It's kind of in the back of my mind, but there have been um, there's things in the news in recent years, like Ebola outbreaks recently, and the Zika virus in Brazil. Um, and you know, I suppose with Ebola, you know, those images you saw on TV of people wearing these biohazard suits that were very sort of homemade and everything, and um, the reports of that kind of got me thinking about it again. But there's also the fact that You know, I think sometimes we think we know everything, um, you know, that modern medicine and modern science can deal with anything that might come up, but it's not really true. You know, and there have been outbreaks of, you know, there was a Spanish flu that killed something like um, 60 million people, I think, at the start of the last century. Um, and it was young, healthy people that were dying, you know, it wasn't just people that were maybe immune compromised or elderly or young. So it was, um, that, that 
text about 100 years ago roughly now, um, but also the HIV AIDS epidemic. When I was a microbiology student, I can remember um, one of my professors saying that um, he was sure they would have a vaccine for it within a year or two, and they still don't have a useful vaccine. And I think it hasn't been in the news as much in recent years in sort of in the West, but it's been um, the estimated death toll from that is about 35 million people worldwide, and it's still up there, you know. So there's always a chance of something like that coming up that we don't know how to deal with. And I just really liked the idea of, of putting something like that in a country like Britain, where people would just think it would never happen to us. They always think it happens somewhere else. And just sort of seeing you know, how they would cope with it and um, what it would be like you know, if we were the people that needed help from the rest of the world. You know how that would be. Do you have a special bond to the song My Sharona? Interestingly, I had another story that was completely different um, ages ago, where for some reason I thought I would name the character Sharona. Um, and I just sort of remembered that, and it just seemed to fit this character. And the fact that she would just be so embarrassed by her mother, you know, naming her this and all the rest of it, I quite liked the idea of that. And I think it gives characters those interesting little quirks, you know, when they've got something strange like that, like their name and the reason behind it. Und zu guter Letzt habe ich sie noch etwas so über ihr Leben als Autorin gefragt, weil das viele, viele, viele Menschen interessiert hat und selbstverständlich auch mich. Und was sie dazu gesagt hat, erfährst du jetzt. Um, really started from a dream that I had, strangely enough, because the, the start of that is um, but there's a prologue when she's running on the beach and something's chasing her, and that was actually from a dream. Um, and I sort of wrote that down um, the same morning I'd had the dream and sort of came up with the idea from there. But I realized there's not a whole trilogy in a very short dream, but it just it grew from that point. Um, and then Mind Games really started from something that I've read, I've been reading about um, sort of the difference between intelligence and rationality, which is sort of something that's behind in the story. And thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if in a future world they were testing and rationality was considered to be the most important thing and what, what that could lead to, you know, so it's sort of like a what if from that. Um, and like I said, the, the new trilogy really, you know, is from this interest I've got in, in, in microbiology and sort of thinking about the um, history and the past and things that have happened before and trying to like that here and see what would happen with it. So, but they come from lots of different places. Do you have any rituals while you write? Rituals? Yeah. Um, I mean, I used to always write first thing in the morning when I wasn't really awake, but I seem to be changing that round and I've been writing in the afternoons a lot more, but I always listen to music when I'm writing, well, 90% of the time at least. I've got certain um, artists and certain albums I like to listen to. I listen to a lot of Mark Knopfler, actually. So um, it just seems to be the right, it puts me into that right frame. And I used to like to write complete silence, but you can't always have complete silence, you know. And if, if I use music that way, it's kind of like, as soon as I hear the first song, it just puts me into that mind frame of writing. But I don't tend to have different music for different books like some people do. I just have certain kinds of music that I like to listen to when I'm writing. anything for months. That's never happened to me. Maybe I'm just lucky. <laughs> That's it. Um, but it, certainly you do sort of pause every now and then and think, well, I'm not quite sure how to get my characters from A to B or what happens in between here. Um, most of my writing I will do directly on a computer, but whenever I'm a bit stuck, I always get in that notebook and pen and write things by hand. And I'll tend to write, um, like if they're, th I'll think of every possible way something could happen and write it across the top yeah. and then have arrows down as to, you know, what the consequences would be. And I find if I do that, usually the answer becomes really, really obvious. Whereas if I just sit there thinking, I'll just go around in circles in my head. So I find using, you know, notebooks and things really helps. Um, and I'll do like flow charts and things like that. But I don't plot a huge amount like some people do in a lot of detail. I tend to, I've been using structure probably more than using plot in that way. So, you know, having a book where you have points of view that alternate and having parts and you know what each part roughly it has a certain structure it sort of provides a frame for it whereas if you sort of look at um, blank pages and think I've got to write 95,000 words oh my god what's it going to be you know that's quite alarming whereas you divide it into pieces like that it just makes it work a lot better but I, I do find I absolutely love writing with alternate viewpoints and it's just you can move the plot in a way that you just can't yeah. when you have just one character so I've really been enjoying that a lot. Do you 
know the whole story before you start writing? No. Or do you live with the characters? No, I don't. I, I have a rough idea, obviously. You have to have a frame. And when you've got a publisher, they want you to write a synopsis of a, you know, if you're doing a trilogy, for example, they want, a, you know, basically a summary of the three books, but I don't stick to it that closely. Yeah. I tend to deviate from it quite a lot. I find writing a synopsis actually really useful, because it, it, especially when, you, when you've written the entire book, trying to write something about it in just one page is very difficult. But when you're sort of starting out and you can sort of see things in it more globally and you don't get sort of bogged down with all the detail, it can really help sort of, sort of give you the frame for it. I think using that word today. To know that you wanted to write books as a job. The first time I can remember thinking I'd like to be a writer was quite a long time ago, actually. I think it was, um, it was when I was 17, but I didn't do anything about it for a long time, to be fair. And I think it's part of the a mixture of reasons. Um, I was absolutely desperate to, you know, get out there and earn a living and do something practical. And I just didn't really think that writing stories was ever going to do that for me. Anyhow, and I was, you know, thinking, what was I going to do? And to be fair, there aren't really that many times in your life, I think, when you're um, an adult and you're sort of re-evaluating what you're going to do for your life. And I just remembered being 17 and wanting to write. I thought I'd never really taken it seriously and I really wanted to. So at that point I decided to, you know, take it seriously. And I had to have other jobs, you know, to pay some bills. But I was also um, writing really seriously from when I first moved here. So that was, I think, 2004 or so since then. Um, so I would get up really early in the morning and write before I went to work for, you know, I get up at five or six, oh. yeah, early, yeah. <laughs> that's that's dedication, and write till five or six, oh, sorry, start at five or six and write for an hour or two before I went to work. Um, I, at that point I was writing everything out by longhand, um, so I would do that in the morning and then in the evening I would edit things by, when I was putting it on the computer and I was um, doing that for a number of years before I wrote Slated. So Slated was actually the ninth complete novel that I wrote and it was the first one I found a publisher for. <laughs> That's good. Right? Yes, didn't give up. Because otherwise we wouldn't sit here. That's right. <laughs> you said that you like to read and I already yep. asked you about your favorite author. Yes. Um, and what is your favorite book? The Lord of the Rings, I'd have to say now, but I don't know, it's funny because I think some people really think in lists, you know, like they know their top ten this and their top ten that. My brain doesn't seem to work that way, so um, quite often things that I'm reading, you know, I'll really be into at the time and then I'll have forgotten about and I'll be reading something else and it sort of changes all the time. I mean, I've just started reading um, a series that I know, it's still, I know it's translated in German as well, it's um, Lockwood and Company, so the first book is The Screaming Staircase, it's my yeah, struggle, it yeah. Um, it's quite a bit younger than the stuff that I um, write normally, but when I'm when I'm writing, I like to read stuff that's really different, you know, and it's just, it's really, it's really funny, it's like spooky, yeah. actually, so um, I just started the first book of that, I'm really enjoying it, so I might end up reading the whole series, we'll see, but um, I read an awful lot of different things, really, and I quite often read books for events, you know, so if I'm doing a panel event with other authors, I usually read one of their books, um, so that tends to be where a lot of my reading time goes. And do you like to read pride and thrillers? Um, as in grown-up ones? Yeah. yeah, not really. I'm too much of a wimp. I get scared. <laughs> <laughs> I do, actually. Um, I don't read very much adult fiction at all. Yeah. Um, I just recently read a Margaret Atwood book, but it was because I was going to a talk that she was doing. It was um, The one that I read was Oryx and Crate, which is a, a series that she has. So that was for grown-ups. And I kept reading it and thinking, I love the idea, I love the story, but there's just so many nasty adult things in here. Which, you know, <laughs> reviews a little bit to get a sense for what people are saying about it but um, if someone links me to review on Twitter I will I'll usually retweet it but if I'm going to retweet it I'll always look at it just to get a sense yeah. um, because I wouldn't want to retweet something that was not very nice and it's quite surprising to me actually that people tag you in on things if they're not you know being nice to you it just seems a bit odd but they do um, so I will usually glance at them you know and if, if they seem like they're going to be very nice I might read the whole thing and um, if it sounds like it's not going to be very nice I usually just don't read it because there's not a lot you can, you know, there's, there's no point in um, trying to say anything to someone about what they've said about your book because they're completely entitled to not like it and, but it, you know, it hurts actually when people say things sometimes, but you know, it's just better to avoid it if you can. Um, I 
think if you spend a lot of time reading reviews on Goodreads, you get depressed. <laughs> because there's lovely reviews there, but you know, there's always going to be the opposite as well, and it's just better to avoid it, I think. It just mucks with your head too much. And actually, if you read really good reviews, that mucks with your head in a different way. You know, it's not really the best thing to read all the time. But yeah. It's good to get a sense of what's being said, but apart from that, I usually leave it alone most of the time. <laughs> yeah, it's, hard, it's hard not to look, actually. Yeah. I've got, I'm better at doing that now than I used to be. You know, when my first few books were out, it was actually really hard not to read everything. So. Um, if you're creating the cover of your books, do you have an idea about what you want to have on the cover? Or the covers? Yeah. Publishers completely are in control of the covers. Okay. If you're lucky, they ask you if you like it before they pick it. So. Oh. <laughs> I love like these. They've yeah. been fantastic. Actually, I love the German covers. They're beautiful. Um, in the UK, because you know that's that's where I live. And that's my original publisher. So the translation deals in Germany and so on are through my publisher in the UK. In the UK, they do ask me a lot about the covers, and we do have long conversations about them sometimes. Sometimes we change bits and pieces, you know. But um, it really is the publishers that choose the covers. And I suppose with the um, different countries, you know, the markets will be a bit different, and they're going to know, you know, what suits their market. And sometimes they'll use the same cover as the UK, um, and sometimes they don't. You know, it's just that sort of judgment call they have about what will sell books in their place. But thank God you have beautiful covers. Yes, I do really <laughs> love these ones, I've got to say. And now my last question. Um, do you have an idea for a book that you want to write but you didn't think the story over, so you didn't write it yet? Um, I have lots of sort of ideas, certainly. I know what I'm writing next, but I'm not allowed to say yet. I know, I know. And I'm really, really excited about it, but I've only kind of just started it, so it's just new. Um, I mean, I've just finished the third book to this trilogy, um, so I'm sort of in the process of editing it, so it'll, it'll be sent off to Germany fairly soon, I would think. I'm not sure exactly when, but fairly soon. Um, but I, am, I have started something else now, so I'll be able to talk about it um, in a while. To get the okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm so excited about the second book. Oh, thank I think you. it will be out in January. In I think that's what they yeah. said, yeah. I'm not sure if that's completely set in stone yet, but that's what I've been told, yeah. Yeah, Perfect. that's what it says there, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But they don't say when exactly, they just say it generally. True. But I think it's okay. It's three more months, and you yeah. have a lot of books I can yeah. read. And the third book is going to be out in next year as well. So, oh, yeah, so okay. you don't have to wait as long for the third one. That's good. I think it's the second one took me quite a long time to write, so it got delayed a little bit. Ich bin wirklich froh, dass ich sie treffen konnte. Sie ist ein wirklich lustiger und sympathischer Mensch und ich hoffe auch, dass ich dich bald wiedersehe, nämlich im nächsten Video. Bis dahin wünsche ich dir ein wunderschönes Leben. Mach's gut. Ciao.